Welcome to the podcast from Central Congregational Church. Thank you for joining today. I hope this message from our church this week is grounding and inspiring, challenging and encouraging, and a helpful reminder that you are loved by God and called to great things. Please rise as you are able for the call to worship. Through Jesus Christ, God shows us what it means to love. We are called to follow Christ's example to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In the name of Christ, we spread the love that we have received in this community into the world around us. Here we are together on Gathering Sunday to sing, to celebrate, to worship God. Let us raise our hearts and our voices and do just that. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It is so good to be with y'all. If we have not met, my name is Patrick. I'm one of the pastors here at Central Congregational Church, and it is my genuine honor to be the one to welcome you into this space and this time, both of which have been set apart for worship, to be a sanctuary, a safe place for us to grow alongside one another, both in our love of God and neighbor. So even if you find yourself sitting next to a stranger, you can be assured, even if it is only in patience, we go closer with Christ as we get to know one another more and more deeply. Uh, That is what the church exists for, and that is certainly what Central exists for, to be a safe place to grow alongside one another. There are lots of opportunities to do that. If you uh, take some time later today to look through the back of the bulletin, you'll see lots of opportunities to participate in book studies, Bible studies. We're actually launching a new series of small groups uh, that'll be home-based in Barrington, Providence. They're groups around the state so that you can participate in a conversation about the fruits of the Spirit, which uh, serendipitously will also be the topic of a sermon series that Claudia and I will be doing together here on Sunday morning. So if you'd like to have deeper conversation about what happens in here on Sunday morning with your neighbors, I hope that you'll take some time to sign up for one of those. We also have opportunities for retreats and other ways to be growing alongside one another. Today, the women's group will be meeting still up at Hamilton House on the patio, on the lawn here, on the patio. Uh, So if you'd like to spend some time getting to know some other folks uh, who identify as female in our congregation, you're welcome to get to know those folks there. Um, There are lots of other things. Actually, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that our kids are leading us in efforts of service to the community, and you'll hear more about that during our children's moment. The basic point that I'm trying to make is that this church doesn't just exist on Sunday morning. Much like our lives in every other way, we continue to live faithfully throughout the week. And if we're honest with ourselves, it's hard to do that alone. It can be really difficult difficult to navigate life and faith without having deep conversation uh, in a safe community where we're encouraged to think deeply about these things. So I hope that that if there is a way for you to participate, I hope that you will consider it. Last thing I want to do uh, while he starts his run down here, I know Patrick wanted to talk about ways to participate in uh, choirs, both for kids and adults. We can all watch him run from the back of the sanctuary (laughs) down. Um, But yeah, while he's coming down, uh, this is the way, if you've been a part of the church, you know this is how we tend to lead into our invocation each week. But I just want to remind you that you are beloved However this week may have looked, whether it was just full of too much stress or it was like the perfect, peaceful, joyful week, you are beloved. Whether you felt like you made a lot of missteps or you felt like you handled every situation perfectly, you are beloved. As we learn from scripture, there is nothing in life that can separate us from the abundant love of God. We don't come here to earn God's love. We come here to celebrate the fact that it continues to pour out for us and to us and through us each and every moment. There is nothing you could do to separate yourself from the abundant love that comes from the creator of the universe. Thanks be to God 
for that. Patrick, would you like to talk about choirs? Sure. So um, you may have noticed there were some singers in the loft this morning. I'm not sure if you could hear them or not, but um, <laughs> glad to welcome back our choir. Next week, we'll welcome back our children's choir as well, so we'll have both adults and children singing in worship. Our adult choir sings, uh, rehearses on Thursday nights, 7.30, and they rehearse at 9.15 on Sundays. And we have Emily, a new member, joining us just this morning. We'd love to see some more. And our children's choir rehearses starting tomorrow at 5 o'clock. So children entering grades 3 through 8 are welcome, and I look forward to meeting a lot of new faces tomorrow. And then they will rehearse at 10.15 on Sunday next week to sing. So um, it's a lot of fun. You make, make a lot of friends. You make a lot of music. Our children and our adults learn to not just sing by rote, but by reading music. And we talk about what the music means and what it means to be leaders in worship. So it's, it's a wonderful experience for all. It's it, and deeply enriching for me, and I hope it will be for you as well as them. So um, come join our choirs. Thank you. Let us gather our hearts in prayer. Oh God, you reside in eternal wisdom and compassion. You are the one to whom all hearts are open and all desires known. We come before you today with thanksgiving for the gift of life and faith. Speak to our hearts as we wait before you and let your Holy Spirit renew us. We join with multitudes around the world offering our praise and our prayers to you. We give thanks for this church and for all who gather here. Worshiping and praising your name in this holy place, we ask your blessing on us as a congregation. May we grow in wisdom so that our lives will be strengthened in order to serve you. With grateful thanksgiving, we offer ourselves to you in the name of your Son, who shows us the path to follow. Amen. God does search us out, and God knows us, and all that we are is open to God. Let us now offer our prayer of confession as found in your order of worship together. Wise and loving God, we confess that there are times when we fail to follow you in the paths in which you would need us. There are times when we fail to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Forgive us when this happens. We thank you that you are always looking for us and that we are never lost to you. We thank you that you always seek us and call us back to you when we go astray. Find us, we pray, and lead us safely home. May we listen to your voice and seek to follow you this day and all our days. Amen. We are called to follow wherever God leads and to love one another as God loves us. And when we fall, we are picked up. When we fail, we are forgiven. Giving thanks to God, let us joyfully live our faith. God forgives us, be at peace. One in life together. Praise to God who created us. Praise to God who accepts us. Praise to God who sends us into the world. And now I would invite you to um, share in the passing of the peace with one another. At this time, everyone, everyone who's a kid is invited to come sit with me down here at the steps. So if you're a kid, in, in size or in spirit, <laughs> you're invited to come sit with me down here for the children's moment. Good morning, guys. Come on down. Come on down, come on down. All right. All right, all right. Do you hear that? We have theme music for you to walk down to. I'm a fan. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, thank you. All right, hi, guys. If we haven't met before, my name is Miss Susanna. Hey. And, well, hey, and this morning is a special morning because we are starting to talk about something that we'll talk about for a couple of weeks. And so I have been, have you ever heard of fruits of the spirit? Have you ever heard that term before? 
It's like the opposite of a pew potato. If you remember a pew potato and you were here during the summer, it's the opposite of pew potato. And that's why everyone should come to church during the summer so you know what Miss Suzanne is talking about. <laughs> These are, it's a potato that's also uh, an Easter egg and it relates to what Paul's talking about. Does that make sense? Are we done? Okay. No, I'm just kidding. So this morning, I have a bunch of really good phrases. Ugh, they're called fruits of the Spirit. They're special words. And the grown-ups are going to talk about them for the next couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about them in church school. And this morning, I was looking at them, and I was thinking about this summer. And this summer, our teenagers went on a very special trip, some of them. They went and did a service week. And one of the things that happened was we got to meet some folks in different places, and one of the places we got to meet folks was at a place called Better Lives, and that's, some, that's a place that spends all day long during the week trying to help people have better lives, to have things that they need like food and shelter, a home, a bed, a place to stay, and things that need, they need in their house. And one of our teens was really inspired by this, Morgan, and I'm going to give her the microphone so she can talk about, after having gone to that event, what she decided we should do as a community. Hi, so I'm Morgan, and what our youth will be doing is we'll be assembling, assembling blessing bags. Blessing bags will be giving to Better Lives Rhode Island, a nonprofit organization which provides support to the unhoused people of Providence. This activity allows our youth to reconnect with this community and partner with whom they served in July with our Youth Mission Week. On Sunday, October 16th, 6th, <laughs> please plan to stay after worship to help us assemble these youth bags. And when you go after this, you will see our poster and you can click the QR code and see more information about it. Thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you so much for sharing with the group the project that we're all working on together. And you guys that morning will get to put things in the bags and make cards for all the folks at Better Lives so that they know that they're loved. Because one of the things that we learned during the summer was one of the things Jesus tells us is love your neighbor. It's really hard to love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor. So if you want to love your neighbor, you have to know your neighbor. Can we say that together? If you want to love your neighbor, you have to you guys, let's, let's say it like we mean it. If you want to, love your neighbor. you have to, love your beautiful, we sound ready. It's going to take time, and we're going to learn all about the ways that we practice our fruits of the Spirit, and one of the ways that that, that is through the blessing bags. We just got started today, and we started with the fruit of the Spirit that's love. So let's have a prayer about love, and then let's go to church school and play some games. Sound like a deal? Okay. Let's take a deep breath in and let it out slowly. <sighs> Say, Dear God, thank you for neighbors. Thank you for leaders. And thank you for blessings. Amen. Good morning. Great to be back, isn't it? The scripture lesson this morning is from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, which is found on page 174 of the New Testament section of your Pew Bible. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all, we're all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, 
God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body. But the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of, of it. This ends the reading. May it bless it to your understanding and our hearts. Would you all pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer, so that whether it's because of me or even in spite of me, it would still be your word that is faithfully proclaimed and your name that is glorified. Amen. One of, my, uh, one of the jobs that I held when I was in high school was as a referee in a club soccer program for six and seven-year-olds. <laughs> Riveting. <laughs> I will say that I did have to kick some parents out. Uh, it's awkward to give someone 30 years your senior a red card, but we will do it <laughs> if you get out of line which happened more often than I think they would probably like to admit now, uh, this many years later. But what, I rem- what that experience reminded me of was my first time playing soccer. Anybody grow up playing soccer in the room might recognize, yeah, I love it, yep. Uh, if you ever watch, you recognize that impulse to just follow the ball around. It's like, the way that they talk about it is it's like bees around some honey. The ball, wherever the ball goes, a little mob of six-year-olds chases after with absolute abandon. They don't care if they're kicking the ball or their neighbor's shins or even their teammates' shins. They're just swinging those legs wildly any time that ball that is way too big starts to roll, to roll past them. It reminded me, I I grew up, you know, my parents did the same thing that I think many parents do, where they let me try a lot of different sports, and so soccer was the one that I was most affiliated with, because I felt like I could go everywhere. I could run anywhere. I loved just, like, getting all the energy in my body out there. I mean, you can see people talk about me pacing in the pulpit. I still have a lot of, like, nervous, anxious energy that needs to get out somewhere, Um, but I could do that on a soccer field. The baseball field was different. The baseball field, my coaches had a rotation. You know, you'd be in the infield one field, the outfield the next uh, the next week, and you'd be on a little bit of a rotation. Now, I loved playing baseball when it was my turn to swing the bat wildly at the ball that was stationary on the t-ball stand. And I loved to play in the infield. Even if I wasn't able to catch the ball, man, did I love having the ball thrown to me, and did I love throwing the ball at other people. But uh, on the weeks where I had to be in the outfield, I felt entirely useless. In fact, I spent most of my time playing baseball uh, on my knees trying to find four-leaf clovers at the back of the field. Because you know what happens in t-ball? The ball never gets to the outfield. 
So I'd be bored. I feel like I was wasting my time. I don't even know that I was processing my time being wasted so much as I just felt like I was bored. Bored enough to take my glove off and root around for the four-leaf clovers, not paying attention to anything else happening in the game until my coach would call, Patrick! And I could go swing the bat again. Unless one of my teammates missed, and then, boy, was I angry at him. I know. But thinking about that experience now, and really as a teenager when I was refereeing, it started me thinking about, like, what the roles are on a good team. I played soccer into high school, where I then started playing lacrosse. And as you grow up in a sport like that, especially a team sport, you start realizing that you have particular gifts and skills to do some things, and you're really bad at some of the other ones. To the point where when I was in college playing lacrosse, I would get frustrated. I played defense. I would get frustrated by all of my offensive teammates because both they were getting all the glory and also sometimes they weren't trying hard enough. And so I would be their opponent in practice getting more and more frustrated that they weren't beating me consistently enough to score goals, which is such a weird thing to be annoyed by. Right? I want to win. That should be what the goal is. But in order for my team to win, they had to, my teammates had to be able to beat me. They had to be better, more efficient. I served a particular role on the team, and they served a particular role on the team. And if they weren't doing their role well, it meant that I had to work harder in my role. And you start to learn in any team sport that there's a mutual dependence. Because unlike six-year-olds playing soccer, we can't all just follow the ball around the field anymore. It's an inefficient way to play a team sport. And if you've ever tried to win a uh, soccer game beyond six years old, you realize that you have to spread across the field. The best, most efficient scorers in, uh, on a soccer team usually only touch the ball inside the goal-scoring area. They're one of my favorite players when I was in Atlanta was a guy named Joseph Martinez, who's now been pushed into retirement, because um, that's the way it goes. But he would only touch the ball, only touch the ball. It would be single touches inside the six-meter box. He would never touch the ball other than that. And he would walk back on defense, which irritated everybody, but he knew his role was just to score the goal. The rest of the team did the other pieces. Now, you can talk about whether or not that's good soccer. I don't know. Are we, are we sports people in this room? I'm still figuring you all out. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I see it. I appreciate it. Okay. But to pivot maybe a little bit, any organization that starts to only care about the CEO and not about the well-being of the people who are actually working to put whatever the product may be together ends up falling apart, right? Because people leave. That's how you build a high turnover. If people don't feel valued in their work, they disappear. And good, because you should be valued in your work. If you've been in a school setting, like, like I was actually in high school, I was not good in chemistry. I still, it makes no sense to me. Uh, so I was like, it was the only class in my experience that I was like really on the edge of failing. And I went to my teacher for help and his response uh, to quote him, uh, have you read the book? Yes, of course I've read the book. We'll read it again, you'll figure it out not valuing his, really probably one of his worst students as someone to invest some time in, meant that what I did was, and I, any high schoolers in the room, please don't do this, uh, do what I say, not what I do, but I just stopped going to first period. It's not a solution I'd encourage. Um, it got me in lots of trouble, but I didn't know what else to do, and as a 16-year-old, that seemed like the wisest option, just stop going. We all walk through life this way. We know the spaces where we're valued and the spaces where we aren't. We know the spaces where our opinion is worth hearing and where it's not. And a lot of times we end up getting caught up either 
by building up resentments for the people who are unwilling to receive the wisdom or the knowledge or the experience or the skill set that we have, and we start to distance ourselves from them, even sometimes making an enemy of them, or we end up working so hard to validate ourselves in their eyes that we're willing to start to chip away at our own ingrained sense of morality, our own value set. You can see this across the board and in uh, and, and for-profit and non-profit organizations as well as folks who are working for elected offices. We will either build resentments or we will start to erode at parts of ourselves in order to appease somebody who probably doesn't even really care about us. So when Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, he's coming into a community that was uh, a very bifurcated community, very similar actually to the way that we describe America now. There was a very strong, wealthy class in Corinth that were, uh, they were traders that had built up an incredible reputation in a very diverse community, and they had be- built a name for themselves and had increased their wealth significantly. And then there were a lot of servants who were responsible for both caring for these folks as well as doing all the grunt work in order to to support it. But when Paul came to Corinth early on in his career, he described a Christian community where the wealthy and the servants were meant to live alongside one another in community which immediately started building tension. Because the way that the church was, by Paul's instruction, to be organized was that it was all equal footing. As long as people were imbued with the, the fruits of the Spirit, which we will be talking about over the next few weeks, as long as people were imbued with the Spirit in order to do the work in the community, everyone was on an equal playing field. Well, in Corinth, they didn't know how to do that, They had never experienced that kind of genuine equality before, so they started building a tier. Which spiritual gifts are the most important? The Corinthian church named the gifts, the fruit, the gift of the fruit of the speaking in tongues, named it as the pinnacle of God's chosenness. And so Corinth then started to create a hierarchy. Which ones are the best gifts? Which ones are the lowest gifts? Who should be the leader? Who should be the subservient? And they started splitting themselves into categories of opposition. And then beyond that, the people who were in leadership who could speak in tongues, they would compare who they were converted to Christianity by. Some would say, I'm a student of Paul. Others would say, I'm a student of Peter. And they would argue about which was the greatest apostle, which was the lesser apostle, so that they could be on a higher rung of this social ladder. There was constant tension where people were either building up their colleagues as enemies or eroding their own faith in order to prove themselves and their society. And so Paul hears about this incredible tension in the community and he writes a letter this first letter. He has a follow-up letter, too, because they don't get it right the first time. But he writes to them using language they would be familiar with. In the first century, it was common for politicians to come into a community and talk about the body, the body of Rome, the body of Corinth, and would describe themselves as, well, everybody needs a head, so I will serve in that role. Everybody needs hands, and so you will be the ones to do the grunt work. Everybody has parts of it that we're embarrassed by, and you will be at this lower rung. And they would use this metaphor of a body to keep people in a hierarchy of uh, society. So Paul came in using that language. We were all part of the body of Christ. The Corinthian church would have been very familiar with it. We're all part of the same body. But instead of talking about a hierarchy within the work of the body, Paul describes a radically new vision for community life, a radically new vision for what the church could be. 
He describes the hands and the feet and the work that's done. He describes how essential an eye and an ear is. The people who can see the truth of the world and the people who are capable of speaking it when it is necessary to proclaim it. The people who have developed talents and skills with their hands, artisans who know how to do important work, and feet who can bear the brunt of the weight in the community. He describes each of these not in a hierarchy but in perfect equality. There is no one better. There is no one worse. And even more than that, he says that in God's world, the parts that we think of as less, the parts that we hide from one another, the parts that we're embarrassed by, are the parts that get elevated in God's vision. We don't need to go into the details of what that might be. But you see what Paul's doing? He's flipping the norms of the society. Basically telling the people who've been describing themselves as the head of the community that by their description, if they see themselves in that way, they are probably the lowest on the rung if there were one. The people who insist on fighting to be held in the highest regard are probably the folks that we should pay the least attention to. You see, you see what Paul is doing here. He's trying to dismantle the structure so that the people could finally begin to realize that we actually do need each other. Not in spite of who we are, not in spite of our ability, our abilities or our inabilities, not in spite of any of these things that are identity markers, but because of them. It's a radical vision for a church that I think is still a challenge for most of us day to day. It challenges our compulsion to walk past the person calling out for help or a meal or a cup of coffee. It challenges our compulsion to write off half of our nation because of their political affiliation. It challenges our ability to try to create clear lines about incredible violence happening in the Middle East and Africa and Asia, all of these places that are torn apart where we so easily want to categorize them as the bad guy and us as the good guy. If we follow this vision, the categories disappear. Which means we have to start treating each person as though they're a gift for my life to have deeper understanding of God. There's one final brief story that I want to share and then um, we can pray together. There's an old story that I think is hilarious So, um, about a monastery that's unnamed. It's one of those stories that, you know, could be true. Who knows? But the monastery leader, a guy named Gurdjieff, started hearing rumblings and rumors in his otherwise very peaceful monastery that this guy that was pretty new was just annoying everybody. They had taken a vow of silence, but for some reason, John, who had just joined in the monastery, every time he came into the kitchen, he would start asking questions, like, I don't know how to make this, can you help me, which would irritate the people in the kitchen, so then they would send him out to take care of the fields, and he'd be out in the field trying to start another conversation with yet another monk who had made a vow of silence, asking about how you were supposed to take care of this plant or whatever the case may be. And then from there, he got sent back into the stables where he could just muck some stalls in peace, leaving everybody alone. And yet even there, somehow, he started singing, and that started irritating the other people who had who had devoted themselves to silence. And so at one point, Gurdjieff had all of these other monks coming to him, complaining about this guy who just would not shut up. 
And so Gurdjieff started making plans to have him sent to another monastery, perhaps one that had more support for someone like him, whatever that might mean, uh, to go have the support he needed, maybe a place that wasn't meant to have silence. And he reached out to an elder of his and just described the situation. And after that conversation, he came back <clears throat> and told each of the monks who had com been complaining that he had had an insight that I think would be good for each of us to hear. Perhaps your annoyance with this man may become instructive for you to learn compassion. There's nothing wrong with him what we're learning is that we have a new discomfort with someone who is outside of our norm. Perhaps our norms and customs need to change before we ask him to. This is the power of an invitation like Paul's. It calls us out of our norms, calls us out of our expectations, calls us out of the deep and hard lines that we have formed against one another to begin to see perhaps our neighbor and eventually maybe even our enemy as someone who has something to teach us about the heart of God. Friends, his work can't be done alone, which is why Paul never asks for people to depart from community life. He always draws the circle wider and challenges us to live faithfully and well at one another's side. Would you all pray with me? May the Lord be with you. With all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, let us pray to the living God. Gracious God, we lift up all of our lives. We lift up this new church year in anticipation of all that you will do through our congregation. We thank you for every person who has called this place home in this time or in the past. We thank you for perspectives, even the ones that are uncomfortable. We thank you for wisdom, even the wisdom that challenges us. We thank you for love that challenges our boundaries even on occasion. And God, we simply ask that you would continue to work through this church and every church to bring new life, to bring an abundance of love, to renew within us a trust that may be deepened over time to a love of neighbor and you more deeply. God, this world is not yet perfect, and so we lift up all of the areas of concern in our lives. We lift up the major headlines and the incredible lack of peace in the Middle East when we simply ask that this war between powers would recognize the lives lost in the margins. We ask for the same in all of the conflicts that go beyond the headlines. And we pray that your healing would be felt in places that deeply, deeply needs it. Both here at home, where we seem to be filled with cynicism and sarcasm about the future that we hold together. And abroad, where we continue to see a deepening rift. We cannot fix any of this, but we simply offer the small parts of ourselves that you have empowered. Help us to be your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, your feet, your beating heart. We trust that you have gifted us for this moment and we simply ask for the ways that we might be empowered to respond to our world in need. Through Christ, who taught us to live and to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This church exists because of the people who make it up. It was because of generations of people gone by that this sanctuary exists at all. It is because of the people who gather in the room that we have opportunities to study and grow alongside one another. It is because of the generosity of this room and the ancestors past that we're able to maintain anything that happens here. So as you have resources, I simply ask you to give generously. Because in the same token, as you have need, I expect you to ask laying aside what pride may be a barrier to be here, simply to ask and you shall receive. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for what we have and we ask that you would receive it as a simple token of our gratitude so that it might be multiplied in this community to nourish the life that exists here and beyond through Christ. Amen. God of grace and glory, We ask that you will bless and use these offerings and each one of us to strengthen this church as we seek to be your people, serving here in this place and in the wider world as well. Through these gifts, may we fulfill your vision for this world. We pray that you will accept them as expressions of our commitment to the ways of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I know many people in this room have lots of power. I know many in this room don't. For those of you who do, it comes with an obligation to care well for people. Not because of your generosity, but because of the inherent value of every human life. For those of you who hold power in boardrooms, in universities, at the state house, wherever you may hold power, you have responsibility to wield it graciously. For those of you who feel you have no power, feel diminished by every interaction that you have with the people around you, who struggle to have any claim of internal value. Hear me, who is mostly a stranger, but is very comfortable with scripture, remind you of a sacred truth. You are of infinite value, made in the image of likeness of God, and there is no one and no thing that could strip you of that inherent self-worth. Do not let people take who you are away from you. You are a gift who is gifted for this world. So as you depart from these walls, may you bear that gift well so that all the world may come to know that they too carry the image and likeness of God without needing to qualify that statement in any way. Go from this place and this time carrying an abundance of peace that comes only through Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you enjoyed this message, please consider leaving a review on iTunes and sharing it with your friends. If you do share it, be sure to tag us so that we can join in the conversation. If you would like to learn more about our church, you can visit us at centralchurch.us. We hope you have a great week, and we hope to see you back again next week.